created by Hironobu Sakaguchi, this science oh, fiction fantasy franchise was a last ditch effort. The success of this game was the difference between Sakaguchi quitting the gaming industry and then returning to university, and even the company producing the game was teetering on bankruptcy. This is the history of the franchise that saved Square and has made a mark on gaming. This is Final Fantasy. Strap in, this is gonna be big. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Press Start to Join, episode 131. I'm Josh. And I'm Alan. For nearly 30 years, Final Fantasy has been the prime example of what RPGs should be. Today, we're going through the evolution of the 15 main installments. So now grab your favorite Moogle and settle in for Final Fantasy. All right, so uh, if judging by the intro and the title, this is going to be a long one. I am <laughs> yeah, doing... No the 15 main games. Yeah, stick with stick with the primary numbering scheme. If we do spin-offs, we will literally be here all night. Yep, yep, but literally. And uh, a thank you for the suggestion goes to Justin. Mm-hmm. When we threw out uh, a, a request for suggestions, he suggested this, and I learned a lot, and I have an appreciation now. Yeah, the Final Fantasy games are, are fairly complex and storied. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, a lot of cool stuff, I even right away, like stuff I didn't even expect. Awesome. All right, so Final Fantasy for the NES, released December 18th, 1987. Wow. It's been re-released about 17 times. The last one was on the NES Classic Edition uh, last year, 2016. Cool. So it was originally planned to be called Fighting Fantasy, but that name was already trademarked by another role-playing series. And, hmm. and we all know who won that fight. <laughs> yeah. Interesting enough, Fighting Fantasy is a British role-playing game, which was created by Steve Jackson, not the one of the Munchkin popularity. Oh, a the different other one. Steve Jackson. <laughs> and Ian Livingstone, who eventually became co-founders of Games Workshop. Wow. <laughs> that's I found that an interesting tidbit, like, right off of the bat. Yeah, so he's just chock full of money-making ideas. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I've no, I didn't look into fighting fantasy because I did not have the time. <laughs> no kidding. Notes took a nice 10 hours to really get the good stuff. Wow. And I still feel like I could have trimmed fat. So... Sakaguchi wanted to make this role-playing game for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem was Square refused to make an RPG because a prediction that it would be have low sales. Eventually, Enix, which was then a rival to Square, released Dragon War Warrior, more popularly known as Dragon Quest, and that became a big success in Japan. Oh, yeah, that's a classic. So because of that success, Square said, Sakaguchi, make your game. And uh, so he got to make his Final Fantasy, which was inspired by older games, uh, Ultima and Wizardry, which were also the inspiration for Dragon Warrior. So hmm. they have the same sort of uh, pool of inspiration there. Cool. So the first game had four basic interfaces, an overworld map where uh, the character was like large and you moved on like a, 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 an, yeah, an exaggerated sort of map just to get around the world. Then okay. it would zoom in for towns and dungeons where there is other players and well, other characters and like buildings you could enter. Mm -hmm. Then there's the battle screen where the enemies were on the left and the heroes were on the right. And then the menu, which was where you would uh, equip characters between mat uh, battles and situations and be able to use other skills. Yeah, all, all the staples. So... The game just started right off the bat. You create a party. Boom. Oh. Uh, there's six occupations they could choose. Uh, fighter, thief, black belt, red mage, white mage, black mage. And uh, the player got to start with a, a, a bunch of money and you were near a town. So you got to go equip your guys right away. <laughs> so kind of like, fuck the story, just make characters and go. It's it's the classic D&D &D starting. Yeah, and then you can go into the castle and the, and the 
you talk to them and the king will be like, oh, hey, I need help. Wow, that really is like the beginning of a Dungeons and Dragons adventure. Yeah. And uh, the game was very well received on this first release. Uh, Mm -hmm. IGN ranked Final Fantasy as the 11th best game on the NES. Uh, Another publication, Games Radar, ranked it as the 8th best, and staff felt Dragon Warrior introduced the genre, but Final Fantasy really popularized it. Yeah, you definitely hear about Final Fantasy first, and it's like, oh yeah, and also Dragon Quest, generally. So, this is definitely, this is an amazing foundation, and even the, uh, the Final Fantasy soundtrack started here with Nobu Umatsu composing this game. Oh yeah, he's good. Uh, The infamous victory fanfare was first heard in this title. (laughs) Infamous is right. Yeah. And the opening battle theme has been reused and used all over the place. And there's tons of references to it. Mm -hmm. Moving on to Final Fantasy 2. Again, it's on the NES. December 17th, 1988. And these dates are generally Japanese uh, yeah. release. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure they really came over to America until like way later. In oh, the yeah. Beginning ones. So Final Fantasy 2 was re-released 15 times, uh, generally Jesus. as a Final Fantasy 1 and 2 advance. And in 2016, it was its last release on J- in Japan on the Wii U Virtual Console. Huh. So... Very similar to the original Final Fantasy, they did introduce a new feature called Word Memory, where a player could, in quotations, ask an NPC, then you would memorize keywords or phrases that you could later use as a selection after you've heard them. What? Like, this was a thing where, in the story, you could find an NPC that could give you information, Uh then later you could go to another NPC and use that information. Where if you w- avoided the first one, there wouldn't be the option. Okay, so it actually tracked on your save yeah. file that you had talked to this person, yeah. so you should know this. An ask and memorize system. Wow, that, yeah, that's actually pretty impressive considering these things still like use batteries to keep memory. Oh yeah. Um, Chocobos appeared in this game. Oh, crazy. This game used... Uh, a not very often use activity based progression system over experience points so the really? characters gain stat points based on their individual use or how they're acquired so eh, I guess not very grinding friendly you had to well, actually so, use them so it's, it's kind of more like uh, classic Elder Scrolls where it's like if you want acrobatics you just have to stand there and jump yeah huh. and uh even though its popularity was from the original Final Fantasy and this being a sequel, it has no locations or characters from the first game. Oh, wow. Well, then then again, I guess that kind of like begin as you mean to continue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Final Fantasy 2 got little attention from non-Japanese reviewers. But after its remakes, where, you know, North American and European audiences actually got to play it, it did get yeah. favorable reviews. Cool. And this one has been actually the lowest seller out of the first 10 main games. Oh, wow. And, interestingly enough, there was, or I guess is, an unreleased English unreleased English version of this game. Oh, they localized it? Yeah, they tried. <laughs> uh, oh, no. Following the success of uh, Final Fantasy in 1990, uh, Squaresoft, the North American Square subsidiary... Mm-hmm. They began began working on the English version of Final Fantasy 2, which they wanted to call Final Fantasy 2 Dark Shadow over Pala- Palakia? Palakia? Mm. Dark Shadow over Palak- Palkia. There, there, there we go. Pokemon. The Pokemon? No. It's got an extra A. Oh, Palkia. Palakia. I don't know. So uh, they produced a beta version. And they even advertised it in several Squaresoft trade publications. Hmm. But uh, the development time was so long, the Super Nintendo came out. (laughs) Oh, jeez. And so they decided to cancel working on Final Fantasy II's translation to work on the most recent release in Japan, the Final Fantasy IV. Oh, so they they just kind of skipped a couple. (laughs) Yeah. 
And they didn't want to confuse North American players, so they re- they released the English Final Fantasy IV as Final Fantasy II. Yeah, and that <laughs> began a whole bunch of confusion for North American players. <laughs> yeah, and uh, an English version wasn't available at all until 2003, where they released this thing called Final Fantasy Origins, and it had updated graphics music, and the translation was done under a new director completely. Oh, fancy. Yeah. Final Fantasy 3, we're just cruising along. I believe the last uh, NES title, Nintendo Entertainment System, okay, came out uh, April 27th, 1990. It's been re-released 11 times, and the last time <laughs> was on the NES Classic Edition, Japanese-only release last year. Oh, dick balls. <laughs> yeah. So, this iteration combines elements from the first two games, and they actually... At, in this one, put the hit points above the target rather than in the caption box. Oh. So the classic experience point system returned from the first Final Fantasy, and this is the first game where characters had jobs rather than, like, a class they were permanently stuck as. Oh, okay. The characters started as Onion Knights, and they were able to learn skills and change jobs, which made each character more versatile. Cool. There is more jobs available as the game progressed and different jobs could utilize different e- weapons and equipment so you could get a job with like a ranged attack or like a pole arm whatever certain jobs had out of combat abilities like the thief could open certain doors without the use of keys oh nice he just lock lockpick and this is the first final fantasy to introduce the steal command for thieves and the jump command for dragoons Oh, Dragoons are awesome. And uh, the summon ability was also introduced, which became a long-running theme with summoning powerful creatures. Oh yeah, that's that's a staple. And uh, we played this, the eventual Nintendo DS remake. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the first time it was released outside of Japan in 2006. What? That was the first time? Yeah, that's why uh, oh. I was so excited to get it. And then I started playing it. I'm like, I don't really like JRPGs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's well, I mean, it is a super old JRPG. They updated the graphics and yep. not a lot else. But now that I did this review, I kind of want to go back to it. Cool. Moving up to Final Fantasy 4 for the Super Nintendo. Nice. Released July 19th, 1991, it's been re-released about nine times, and the last time was in 2014 for Windows. (laughs) That's unexpected. Uh, After completing Final Fantasy III, Square planned two Final Fantasy games, uh, one for the NES and the other for the SNES, so it would be Final Fantasy IV and V. Okay. But due to funding issues, Square actually dropped the plans to make the NES game to focus on the SNES game, and then they called that new game Final Fantasy IV. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. So there's little information about this NES game that was, uh, there's nothing more than like a a mock-up screenshot that they released for a Japanese magazine. Oh, jeez. And uh, Hironobu Sakaguchi actually said that the NES version was approximately 80% done. (laughs) <laughs> oh, wow, that's got to burn. And they used uh, some ideas for the SNES game. I should hope so, frickin' 80%. So this game ac- introduced the active time battle system. And the active time battle system has each character gaining charge and an action bar. And then once it's full, uh, they would be able to perform an action and then their bar would be depleted until until it would be full for them to make another action. Mm-hmm. And they, they still like dabble with that system to this day. Oh, yeah. There's so many systems. <laughs> yeah, true. So in this game, they made characters with unchangeable classes. The, uh, the lead designer, Takashi Tokita, said this was his first project as a full-time employee. Hmm. I, I picked this guy because he had plans to be a theater actor, but after working on this game, he decided to become the great creator of video games. Oh, the <laughs> great. That's why I've definitely heard of him. Definitely. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, the director of Final Fantasy 3 was involved quite a bit in this development. He 
he was a little upset because he wanted to see a more seamless battle system, one without menus. So since Final Fantasy IV wasn't going in that direction, he left development on it to work on The Secret of Mana. Okay. Which is uh, actually a title that comes up when you look up uh, Final Fantasy spinoff titles. Yeah, it's well, it's kind of like a spiritual spinoff. Yeah. But uh, due to cartridge limitations, the game script was reduced by 25% of its original length. Ouch. The lead designer, Takeda said he made sure that mostly it was extra dialogue that was cut out to keep the story intact. Yeah, I should hope so. And this game was well received where reviews rarely came under 80%. Oh, wow. Good on them. Final Fantasy V for the Super Nintendo. December 6th, 1992, it first came out. It's been re-released around nine times. The hmm. last time was on the Wii U Virtual Console in 2016. I say around because, like, I don't know if you would count each region as a re-release. So I, and then later, the uh, the way they describe re-releases changed in the articles. So I was like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not an exact science. Yeah. So this game greatly expanded the job system and it was really praised for the freedom that this gave players to customize each character cool uh this final fantasy uses and refines many combat and gameplay from previous games it again uses the active time battle system but uh it's now indicated by a bar that fills up based on character speed Not oh so it's like a hybrid yeah interesting With uh, all the classes available, this Final Fantasy adds three more classes. It adds Blue Mage, Time Mage, and Mime. Blue Mage is a weird one. Yeah, I actually had to look up Blue Mage. I did not know what they were. Oh, you never played, uh, like, Final Fantasy IX? Nope. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) But yeah, they, uh, from what I looked up, they learned abilities by being attacked by creatures, then they could do those attacks later. Yeah, surviving. Yeah. Survive hits in order to, to do them. I I don't think in this game. I think they could be killed by it and Phoenix downed and be able to do it. That would be kind of awesome. So in this game, characters could set a secondary command where they could have secondary abilities based on previous jobs. So okay. you could have like a knight with black magic, which is something I did a lot in Final Fantasy Tactics. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, yeah, two swords and, and that Hamedo. Yeah. So, her, should I? Would I? Would it be better if I just called him Hiro, Hironobu or Sakaguchi? Uh, what, whatever his last name is, let's be respectful okay. here. Sakaguchi, before the release of Final Fantasy IX, he called this his favorite of the series. Oh, nice. So the English translation started right soon after the J- Japanese release. So this would have been titled. Final Fantasy 3, but it was cancelled. There was ideas to make it a standalone title. This did not make it into English. So, the translator, uh, he comes up a few times, Ted Woolsley. Ted Woolsley. Damn it, Ted. Yeah, said in a 1994 interview, Final Fantasy 5 is just not accessible enough for the average gamer. Then there was a rumor that they would release uh, it in English as Final Fantasy Extreme, but then they cancelled that. <laughs> then they tried a third time to release this game in English. Uh, Top Dog Software was going to make it for Windows, but that also was cancelled. Damn it, Ted! And with <laughs> all these attempts to make it in English, Final Fantasy V is the first Final Fantasy to receive a full fan translation. <laughs> no kidding, they're just <laughs> like, fuck it, Ted, you had one job, now we're doing it. Yeah. Uh, it's a, a great reception with uh, with uh, reviews coming around 85% on average. Nice. Final Fantasy VI on Super Nintendo released April 2nd, 1994, and that's for both the J- Japan and North America release. Finally. Yeah, I know, right? 
So it's been released around six times, with the last time being on the Wii U Virtual Console in 2015. Makes sense. This game has 14 playable characters, which is the oh, most damn. for the series. <laughs> uh, there was not much introduced as a new feature for this game, but it seems to be, from what I've read, the pinnacle of 2D Final Fantasy games. Oh, wow. So they did add this other thing called Magisite. Magisite? I'm not sure how, how they want me to pronounce that, but mm. it's this equipable crystal that uh, could summon creatures or activate some specific magic spells. And then holding on to this, uh, your character would gain these ma magic acquisition points that would basically level up the Magisite and make it more powerful and thus the user of it more powerful. So it's like a second little experience thing. Cool. So the development came right after they released Final Fantasy V. It took about a year to make this game. The regular director, uh, Sakaguchi, was not able to focus completely on this due to... He wasn't able to focus directly on this, so he had to share his duties. And these guys keep coming up. Uh, Yoshinori Kitase was the event production and scenario. And Hiroyuki Ito did the battle system. And these guys are, like, definitely the veterans of the series. Oh, wow. So this game became pretty censored when it became localized. Oh, really? Our, uh, our old friend, translator Ted Woolsley, explained... It, Ted. There's a certain level of playfulness and sexuality in Japanese games that just don't exist here in the USA. But Basic they could have, Ted. They could have. Basically because of Nintendo of America's rules and guidelines. No, it's because of Ted. He's <laughs> the gatekeeper of fun for all of this culture. He must be. So there was many changes made to the game where objectionable graphics were covered up. Uh, all the bars, like the saloons and stuff, were changed to cafes. Religious elements removed, like the ability holy became pearl. And references to death and violent actions and expressions were softened, if not completely removed. Ted Woolsley, the original four kids. Well, yeah, well, he had to follow Nintendo of America's guidelines. He could have been a rebel. <laughs> he could have. He could have been fired. He could have stood up for something worth standing up for. Yeah. So... <laughs> There was a PlayStation release of this game that featured minor changes uh, from the English localization. Uh, the The title was fairly unchanged. There was a full motion opening and ending for uh, battle scenes. There is bug fixes. Oh, that's always good. And they added a memo save, which allowed players to save their progress on the PlayStation's RAM, which Ooh. only makes me think as soon as you turn it off, it's gone. Yeah, probably. So you could just, like, basically checkpoints, but you still need the memory card. Yeah. And there was uh, some special features included, like, a bestiary and artwork gallery. Those things I never look at, but are <laughs> really cool features for people that care. And uh, this game came with an amazing reception, usually around 90%. Oh, wow. And many gaming publications called this one of, if not the best RPG on the Super Nintendo. I've definitely heard a lot of people say it's their favorite Final Fantasy. I've yeah. never played it myself, but it looks interesting, and it's definitely got some iconic stuff. Final Fantasy VII. This is where it gets real. This is where it gets 3D! Yeah, it's PlayStation. It was released January 31st, 1997. They finally jump ship from Nintendo. It's been re-released eight times, with the last being on Android in 2016. And there's another one coming. Yeah, an HD remake was announced at E3 in 2015. You know, they've been <laughs> announcing HD remakes on and off for like years. They've done a <laughs> handful of HD remakes already. Yeah, but this is more hd -er. <laughs> What? Okay. <laughs> so this this one has a lot of interesting stuff about it. Development began in 1994 on a Super Nintendo build of this game. Oh, wow. They planned it to be a 2D game like the previous ones. So 
After they completed a 2D prototype for the SNES, the team actually put it on hold to help the Chrono Trigger game release. Oh. And after Chrono Trigger came out, they resumed development on Final Fantasy VII in 1985. Okay. So, after they returned to the project, they considered making it a 3D game instead. So, at this point, this means they had to make a decision whether they were going with the N64, the Sony PlayStation, or the upcoming Sega Saturn. Oh, that would have been weird. Oh, man, that <laughs> timeline would have been weird. I know, this is, this is interesting. So, <laughs> they tested with the N64, because they're all buddies Nintendo, because yeah. there was the 64DD peripheral. If you don't know what that is, oh. it's a disk drive that would lock to the bottom of the N64. But using this caused a low frame rate, and uh, they didn't really like that for their game. Yeah, it, it wasn't a very good peripheral. <laughs> and it was later determined that for the size of the game they had in mind, it would have required 30 64 DD discs to run this game properly. Jesus. Well, I mean, <laughs> they, they were floppy disks. They were just floppy disks yeah. instead of game cartridges. It wasn't a better technology. So Square decided it'd be best to move to the PlayStation for the advantage of the CD-ROM format. And as speculation, I'm assuming they didn't go with the Sega Saturn to avoid trying to launch a brand new console. They went with what's already there. That, oh, that timeline, like that, somewhere out there, there is a world where Final <laughs> Fantasy VII launched on the Saturn, and I would like to like look into that world and see where gaming is now, yeah. see where Sega is now. Everyone would have a copy because the Sega Saturn had no DRM, and you could just burn a disc and run it. Yeah. So, this is the first title to use full motion video and 3D graphics. Then, <laughs> oh, I still remember though, because a couple of the really important cutscenes with like the full motion graphics and everything, they had lip syncing with no voice acting, so the mouths would move and there was captions at the bottom. Yep. They, it's weird. They did not have uh, voice acting yet. <laughs> so many, a lot of veteran staff returned for this. The series creator and producer, Sakuguchi, director, Kitase, and composer, Umatsu. Mm, he's, that guy, he's, he's still doing Final Fantasy music. He's oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, the gameplay remained largely the same from previous titles. The exploring uh, segments of this game was now done with pre-rendered scenes that a player could navigate from cinematic camera angles. Mm hmm And, uh... For the time, the development was very big for this game. Really? Uh, development and marketing costs over $40 million US. Jesus! And I think I saw for inflation, that would be in 2016, $61 million. That's an expensive game. Uh, the staff was between 100 and 150 people between both Japan and American offices. The American office was located in Los Angeles, and they were primarily responsible for making all the city backgrounds. Okay. And at this time, for reference, video game development teams usually average 20 people. Yeah, like they're little small, fast, lean, cheap teams. Yeah. So this game got commercial and critical success, like, all over. Oh yeah, it was huge. It's regarded to be one of the best games for PlayStation, and some people even say greatest of all time. Wow. For the time, its graphics and gameplay music were just the best of the best. And it won a ton of Game of the Year awards. And uh, many believe that this is the JRPG that brought this style to, to the West. That's, yeah, well, I mean, it definitely helped that the yeah. development was partially in the States. Well, for background it artists. Just, well, it, it's still, they, they involved Americans instead of just like, here's a Japanese game, localize it eventually, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. And uh, it received a little criticism on localization. Not as much as other titles. Yeah. The gameplay at its core, very much the same. There was the 3D engine, so there wasn't sprites anymore. Everyone was a 3D character. Mm -hmm. And now, when you're on the overworld, it's a 3D world where you could see mountain ranges and cliffs, which were obvious physical barriers instead of just a 2D representation of that. It was pretty crazy. This game also introduced the limit meter, 
where enemies attacking you charges your limit meter so you could perform powerful limit break moves. I sound like a a mom reviewing it from the back of the box. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you you've never played it. You're just no. this is the history. This isn't a review. Yeah. Uh speaking of reviews, it got amazing reviews for its time and they were generally in the high 90s if not given 100% scores. Yeah, it it was a big deal. It was kind of a game changer. Oh yeah, the the way that it it didn't so much from from my perspective anyway. It didn't so much change the base formula as it did enhance the hell out of it. So Final Fantasy VIII for the PlayStation again came out February eleventh, nineteen ninety nine. That's a good one. And it was released once, one other time. Really? Wow. For Windows in 2000. I, I guess a lot of other people also don't think it's one of the better ones. I mean, it was, yeah. It's. I think it was my first, so it definitely holds a special place in my heart, but a lot of people didn't like it that much. And also that it was re-released as like a greatest hit, but that's as much as I, yeah, it's just rehashing the same thing. Well, that's just, here's a version of the game that's 20 bucks. Yeah. So, development for this began when they were translating Final Fantasy VII, back in 1997. Hmm. So, this uses the same sort of 3D and pre-rendered backgrounds of the Final Fantasy VII. Mm Mm-hmm. The, uh, the series creator, Sakaguchi, was only an executive producer, as he was busy on the development of Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. Oh no. So direction was left for the hopes for the so direction for this game was left to series veteran Yoshinori Kitase, who's directed games previously. Oh, and he he left the, the game for the movie that wasn't good very much at all. I've seen oh. I've seen articles where it's like, was this sleeping giant? Like blah blah blah. Did we not appreciate it? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not reading that article. I didn't like that movie. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a very good movie. It was bland as hell. So this is the first Final Fantasy to use realistically proportioned people. Yeah, it was definitely like a pretty drastic departure with a lot of realism in there and like military industrial complexes and yep. guns. And and it also used the first composed intro where it had uh, like a theme song, like a Bond movie. Oh, yeah, that um, it, oh, I have that on my iPod and I can't remember the name of it. I can't. I, I didn't write it down, but I remember it's a Chinese vocalist they had. Uh, Umatsu composed the music and she sang to it. And now I've just got Duel of the Fates stuck in my head. So yeah, that's the good, one. great. That's th- that's definitely not it. <laughs> so in this one, they changed the way magic worked completely. They replaced yeah. magic points with the new junction system. And characters would uh, channel to summon uh, guardian forces or to use spells. And uh, it says draw points would be found in environments or refined from items to gain new spells or even increase character stats. Mm -hmm. So you had to find stuff around to upgrade your character? Pretty much. I mean, I haven't touched the game in quite a while. But uh, yeah, the the progression of that kind of thing, like it, they didn't focus quite so much on magic. Mm. And and like I said, it's it. It's leaning more towards Realism. like there is magic, yes, but also technology and guns and gun swords. Yeah, I was gonna say gunblade. Yeah. <laughs> so limit break was uh, continued with this game. Mm-hmm. They also changed the experience system quite a bit, where each level was a flat a thousand XP to level up. Uh, enemies in the world would level up proportionally with the power of your party. So that means mm. enemies would be far more durable and have more abilities at their disposal at higher levels. Oh, okay. So everything just scales with you. Yeah, like like uh, Skyrim. That explains a lot. And players could reach max level before even beginning the plot if they wanted, but it would just make beginning enemies much harder. Yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't help at all. So this game also introduced the first mini game, really, with the triple triad card game. That was actually really fun. Uh, from reading this description, I had no idea how it works. 
<laughs> I I don't remember how it works either. I just remember playing it a lot. Yeah, they uh basically it was based on trading cards. Yeah. Uh, it started as just a collecting game, but uh, of the programmer that made it, uh, Kentaro Yasui said he really wants it to be part of the game, so he added he got his idea of it turning into items into the game to make it more important. Cool. Because they sort of felt it was disconnected from the game. So. <laughs> they felt it was a, a way to keep the player's interest during long stretches without cutscenes. I thought it would be more of like a side quest. They almost it, made it sound like it was for loading screens. No, it, it definitely was a side quest. Well, I mean, like kind of an optional. It like, um... Uh, poker in Red Dead Redemption. You can do it on the yeah. side, but you absolutely don't even need to touch it ever. Okay. So the director, Kitase, aimed for this game to look more realistic than previous titles, like we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. the, the title aimed for the use of bright colors, like natural bright colors, and uh, they used lighting and the shadows more effectively. To uh, give the game a little more realism, they added rental cars as the transportation in the <laughs> overworld. Yeah, they they kind of like, hey, you know, chocobos. Yeah, those are um, don't don't look over there. Cars now. Yeah, uh, they used motion capture to make the characters have a more natural movement. Oh, cool. And uh, they felt they needed to make this game more bright after the dark, gritty world of Final Fantasy VII. And hmm. uh, they wanted a foreign atmosphere, so there was a lot of inspiration taken from ancient Greek and Egyptian architecture. And a lot of the cities were based on Paris. Oh, yeah, I could see that. So this game got a great reception. Ratings generally between 80 and 90 percent. And like I said, it was re-released -re on Windows, where PC, uh, for where a uh, computer gaming world gave it a two out of five. <laughs> oh, <laughs> savage. PC Master Race hating on the JRPG. <laughs> Final Fantasy IX for the PlayStation. This was a big deal. Yeah, like, seeing my friends play these games, this was the one I always was very confused with, because I saw 7, uh-huh, 8, uh-huh, and then 9. What? It, it, it was a big jump back to the more whimsical NES, SNES Final Fantasies. Yeah. So it was released July 7th in the year 2000, re-released two times, and the last time was for Windows in 2016. Hmm. It was developed alongside Final Fantasy VIII, but they wanted a more traditional style that was more... It was very heavily influenced on the original Final Fantasy. Yeah, I can definitely see that. So the gameplay remained mostly the same as previous games. They did add the active time elements and Mognet. So active time elements were just events that the player could witness from different locations. And sometimes the player would be controlling two parties through these active time events where it would be like, this team does this, cut away, now you're doing this segment, but it's supposed to be simultaneous. Yeah. Yeah. And Mognet was basically a Moogle-based communication system where you could send and receive messages. I did like Mognet. <laughs> <laughs> Magic points came back in this game. And yeah, well, I mean, you had, Black Mage was one of the characters, so yep. I should hope so. And a card game called Tetra Master was added for this game. I couldn't find like any good information about Tetra Master. I don't know if I played that that much. I can't really remember. So Final Fantasy IX used a very heavy Final uh, Fantasy setting. It used mm -hmm. a, I I couldn't say the word fantasy without saying final. Oh my god! <laughs> it's because they worried that Final Fantasy VII and VIII, it had with their more darker realistic tones it was starting to alienate audiences yeah that's that's kind of how it came across as like a knee jerk like final fantasy 7 was getting into like realistic oh corporations are evil guys with big swords and then 8 was oh there's guns and military industrial complexes and then 9 is like hey you're a guy with a monkey tail it's all cartoony and stylized let's kidnap a princess with your black mage in your <laughs> night 
Yeah. Uh, heavily inspired by Norse and Northern European mythology, the yeah. characters were a high priority in this game. They wanted them to look more cartoonish, but have, mm. but be more realistically relatable as characters, like a rounded personality that you would believe is a person. Yeah, I and I think they they pretty well nailed that. Like they they look cartoony, but a couple of them have some pretty uh, serious stuff going on. It's like, oh, are are you okay? <laughs> so the release of this game was initially initially. Uh, the release was initially delayed. Oh, really? They did this to avoid their game being direct competition to their rival, Enix, releasing Dragon Quest VII. Yeah, that would have caused issues. <laughs> and uh, October 7th, 2000, they had a demo at uh, the Metron in San Francisco, California. Cool. They gave away limited merchandise, and they were really excited because fans showed up in cosplay as classic oh, nice. characters from Final Fantasy. It's awesome. And for Canadians, there was a production error for this game. Oh no. Uh, many games had the English instruction manual left out. So oh, that sucks. extra copies were shipped to uh, retailers and you could go pick it up if, with proof of purchase. Oh, that's, that's something at least. Yeah, and this game had a great reception, usually in the 90s. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. The, the boss kind of got off the rails, like the final boss, oh. but it it suffers from the whole, okay, everything was leading up to this one fight, and that's done, and suddenly there's a bigger bad who was pulling the strings behind the scenes all along. This makes no sense, but okay, we're fighting now. That seems to happen in a few of these games. It's like, that's yeah. the worst person, and then it's like, but that's my boss, and it's like, oh, what? Yeah, and it's like, okay, so I guess you're trying to destroy everything because you want there to be nothing in the world ever anymore? Okay. Sure. Now we're now we're just like flying through a fucking iTunes visualization and <laughs> fighting. Yeah. Final Fantasy X for the PS2. This was the... Uh, first main title I ever played. I'm so sorry. I actually w want to go back to it because I feel like I was expecting like Devil May Cry. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's... Oh, it is not that. Because I was just told, oh, it's so good. I spent so much time playing Blitzball right in the beginning, though. I barely actually did, like, the game. I think I, like, <laughs> ran out of money or something playing Blitz Blitzball. Oh, good good scrub. I remember there's, like, a river, and then I started playing Blitzball, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> so, July 19th, 2001, it came out in Japan. It's been re-released about three times. The last time was on Steam uh, in 2016. Well, hey, at least your first uh, Final Fantasy wasn't ten two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... Now it's on PlayStation 2. They can leave the pre-rendered backdrops behind and the game's full in 3D. Cool. So I I thought I said the other game was the first to feature voice acting. Uh, 8? Yeah. I no, don't know eight, that it was. Or 9, you mean? 9 featured... No, 8 featured realistic characters. 10 yep. had full lip sync voice acting. Yeah, I didn't think that any of the others had voice acting. Yeah, oh, I'm getting all... I'm not trusting my notes. Trust your notes. <laughs> the uh, active time battle system was replaced with a conditional turn-based battle system. And uh, they changed the way characters leveled up with this new thing called the Sphere Grid. Oh, yeah, that thing. That, that was interesting. Yeah. This is the first game where the main character was controlled in third person. And uh, you directly control Titus to interact with the world and all Wait. the terrain. What? Titus? Oh, okay. Titus? You mean like not fixed camera? Yeah. Oh, you control yeah, him yeah, in yeah. third person. Oh, I was I was thinking like, I guess technically the other games aren't third person because the camera's not following. The yeah, character. it's like it's isometric. Like cinematic angles. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now that the terrain's all rendered to scale, the overworld function was essentially removed. Mm -hmm. And uh, encountering an enemy switched the game to like the classic turn-based combat. So the combat remained pretty much the same, except for the replacement of the active time battle. So now the conditional turn-based battle system removed the stress of deciding actions, because uh, the game would pause and let you decide your next action. 
Yeah, it's it's like because with active, the bar would fill, and then you have a chance to choose. But everyone's bar continues filling until it hits, and then so, you have to. So it's go decide, 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 decide. <laughs> Yeah, and um, whereas the conditional one, the, the bars would fill, and then as soon as one fills, the bars pause, you can choose the action, and then the bars continue to fill, and you go to the next one. Yeah, which is actually what I thought was happening until I got to this in my notes. And I was like, oh, damn. Active yeah. meant active. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like if, if you let everyone's bars fill and just do nothing, you can just ke- keep getting wailed on yep. if you're not paying attention. In the old games, not this one. Yeah. So limit breaks were in this game, but now is overdrives. Uh, summoning changed with the introduction of Aeons. And mm-hmm. uh, an Aeon would essentially replace the party, but have all the characteristics of a player. And uh, they would leave battle once they were defeated, uh, they were dismissed, or they eventually won. Yeah, so instead of like summoning a thing and it doing a huge attack, you summon a thing and then you fight as it yeah. for a while. So the sphe- the this sphere grid system replaced the old level up system, where a player would be able to select nodes on the sphere grid to unlock different stats. And one note was uh, you could customize your character to the extent of making its stats completely contrast the class. Mm-hmm. The, the example of making a white mage a melee powerhouse and a swordman specced as a healer. <laughs> yeah, because you can just go wherever you want on the skill grid. I think that's why I did so poorly, because I didn't understand how to level up characters. That That's easy to misunderstand if you're not paying attention, because that yeah. tutorial goes by fast. It's not. No, not only that, just I didn't understand RPGs, so I didn't know where oh. to put my stats into. That'll do it. So this is the first time the regular composer Umatsu had help with the score for a main series game. Oh, shit. He was assisted by two people, uh, Masashi Hamazu and Junya Nakano. They did good work. So Hmm. he chose them because they could work outside of his style, but they were all still good at working together. Okay, so complementary but different. Yep. I like it. The original soundtrack had 91 tracks. That was over four discs. Wow. And uh, the rock band led by Umatsu called the Black Mages had three tracks that featured in this. Fight with Seymour, Otherworld, and The Skies Above. I I love it. (laughs) I I want to know more about this band. (laughs) The Black Mages, he has uh, two albums out that I know for sure. (laughs) <laughs> I, I need to find them. <laughs> uh, very well received. Uh, reviews averaged in the 90s, and it spawned a sequel, 10 2, that featured the heroines of the game that had an outfit based equipment system. It sure did. <laughs> <laughs> End of discussion. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, good thing we're only doing main series. Goodbye, 10 2. That's it. Final Fantasy XI, released on PS2, Xbox 360, and Windows. This was a weird one. Yeah, it came out in Japan, May 16th, 2002. It was a departure from the regular formula, as this is an MMORPG. So, it did make a mark for being the first MMORPG for being, uh, for having crossplay. Car- players could play between PS2 and 360. The game servers were separated and they were not separated into regions or console type. They were all together and named after summoned creatures from previous titles. This might be the last time Sony let crossplay happen also. <laughs> <laughs> so players of all languages were able to communicate because there was a library of phrases you could select from. And of course, whatever you saw on your screen was your language of choice. Yeah, that makes sense. So unlike previous games, you would make an avatar, which you could customize. You could do race, gender, your face, hair, body style, job, and your allegiance. Fancy. So like Final Fantasy X, this game's full in 3D. It's MMO. We already did our Blizzard episode all about WoW. (laughs) Yeah. Players travel and interact with each other. 
they roam enemies in this would roam the landscape rather than be a random encounter okay. and battles would occur in real time the game is divided into missions and quests this is kind of cool missions would advance the game plot so that would increase your player's rank and that would give you access to new areas. Mm -hmm. Quests did not advance the story at all, but it could grant you extra rewards or even fame, which would increase your reputation with NPCs so they would address you higher. Interesting. And I assume unlock other features. So you would do missions for your home nation and later could change allegiances to do other missions for other nations. Cool. So it was criticized. It had uh, little player versus player combat. It had a strong focus on PVE. And there was dungeons that would range between a six player dungeon up to 64 player raids. Wow, that seems untenable <laughs> on like the old dial up speeds. Yeah. Oof. It's only. It's only 2002. <laughs> Yeah, I was on dial-up until like 2006 because I was out in the country. Yeah, I guess dungeons for you and cable had raids, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I didn't get the uh, the review for that one. Whoops. All right, It's an MMO. It's, reviews are hard. <laughs> yeah. Final Fantasy XII, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a XII. classic one. That was a lot of fun for a lot of people. Uh, came out March 16th, 2002. HD Remaster came out July 2017 for PS4. Ooh. So this game had a lot of innovations for the franchise. A large open world, and they split it up into zones. A seamless battle system. Controllable camera, because now you can spin it around your character. Mm-hmm the new gambit system to control AI companions and a license system, which was used to determine what abilities and equipment your characters could use. And it had and it, classic elements like chocobos and moogles. Yep. And I believe it's also one of the first times that it's, um, that they, they revisited a world from another final fantasy game. In mm. this case, it was the world of final fantasy tactics. So not a uh, main games entry. But uh, it, it, in, the lore interacted with that game. And it yeah. It was really cool. The uh, development began in 2000 with the Final Fantasy Tactics director, Yasumi Matsuno, and the Final Fantasy IX director, Hiroki Ito. So Matsuno planned the plot, but he had to leave due to health concerns. Oh, and, that's no good. And the, the team changed to and reformed in his absence. Hope he was okay. So... Sakaguchi was disappointed that Matsuno had to leave, and he declined to play the game past its introduction. Oh, what? He basically That's only so played what Matsuno worked on. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> it's, it's a little strange. Yeah, because it's like, well, it's still like his legacy. He was still involved in like planning and. Hmm. Yeah. And unfortunately, some features were abandoned due to hardware limitations. There was a two-player mode planned and a mob hunt mode where you could recruit NPCs. And I think it would be sort of like a monster hunter scenario. Oh, I wish that game had been two-player. Then I could have <laughs> like played with my then-girlfriend, now-wife yeah. at all as she poured hours and hours into it. So Final Fantasy XII once held the Guinness World Record for longest development period of a video game production, which was oh, five wow. years Oof. at the time. Yeah, back in the day, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, it changed a lot to do with battles. Random mm -hmm. encounters weren't in this game. Enemies could be seen roaming the world. Yeah. They introduced the active dimension battle system where... Which was interesting. Yeah. It, was, it was good, I think. The battle initiates when you get near an aggressive enemy or you initiate attack or if the plot saw fit for it to start. Yeah. Characters or enemies would begin having lines leading to their target and the lines had different colors based on what action would be taking place. The player could jump between characters to issue commands to each of them, but if there was a guest, they were always AI controlled. And uh, 
you could swap active characters with inactive characters at any time. Unless they were targeting an enemy or being targeted. Yeah, otherwise that'd just be like a really cheesy way to dodge attacks. Yeah, and you could even uh, have knocked out characters substituted with not knocked out characters. Mm -hmm. So the Gambit system like, sort of allowed you to program characters where you set a trigger condition for a specific character to take actions. So they would have a target, then they would perform an action at a priority setting. One example yeah. they gave was like, when 40% health, perform heal on an active player being the uh, the player as the priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with, with the fights, like you, you encounter an enemy and then you end up in like this walled off thing and you're actually running around um, basically waiting for your your active battle meter to fill. Yeah. And once it gets full, then you can do an attack or an item or something. And that gambit system made it so that you could really focus on yourself and your AI would mostly figure itself out. You can tell, like, okay, prioritize the enemy that I'm attacking. If someone's low health, heal them, that kind of yeah. thing. It was, it was pretty slick. They added a new energy called Mist. It was used in some instances. You could defeat these espers, which were summoned creatures from past games, mm -hmm. and then you could summon them later. Uh, but an esper would follow secret gambits, and you couldn't ever directly control them. Oh, weird. I don't remember that. Most of them were references to summons or bosses from previous games. Mm -hmm. uh, they added quickenings as a sort of new limit break system. Powerful attacks that could be strung together to be more powerful when you had a timed button press. And then they called that a mist chain. Ooh, fancy. And when a mist chain was a specific length, it would end the cycle, and that was called a concurrence. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> so confusing. Uh, the level up system was changed to something they called the license board. From what I saw, it was basically the sphere grid, but uh, not on a sphere, on an actual grid. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the standard. You have a grid of abilities and you kind of like follow specific paths to get certain powerful yep. things. And the, the unlocks on it would be sort of like the skills within jobs that allowed you to, which allowed you to get new equipment options or access new abilities. Yeah. So it received many Game of the Year awards. Reviews really were good. either within the 90% if it wasn't 100%. It was a very pretty game, too. And it sold 2 million copies in Japan and became the fourth best-selling PS2 game. Oh, wow. That's actually saying a lot, considering how long the PS2 was in production. <laughs> yeah. Final Fantasy 13 for the PS3 and Xbox 360. This one, I... I know very little about this I was going to say, I knew... I d hardly knew it existed... Yeah. <laughs> Through sheer logic of knowing there was a 14, I knew this existed. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's like, well, there's a 15 now, so there had to be a couple other in the middle there. So it was released December 17th, 2009. Hmm. It's been re-released twice, and the last time was on Android and iOS in Japan in 2010. Weird. So this game introduced a few new things. A fast-paced combat system, a new leveling system called Crystarium? <laughs> okay. And uh, Paradigm. P oh, paradigm. Par yeah. Oh, thank you. You just, you smart in your book words. A paradigm <laughs> system, which allowed you to control character abilities. Uh, classic elements returned, uh, like summon monsters, chocobos, and airships. Cool. As I wrote that note, I realized I forgot to mention airships in any of the other games. Oh, yeah. So there there's been tons of airships. Was them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ever since the beginning. Oh, yeah. Airships. Nothing but. So many, <laughs> you don't even think to reference them. Well, just because like they were like, we need an overworld, but we need a way to go over mountains. And water. Uh, yeah. Flying boat. Yeah, sure. Done. Nailed it. No, it's like... <laughs> oh, we... wait. No, sorry. Final Fantasy VIII. It was a flying city. Oh. My bad. So <laughs> development began, began in 2004, and they announced it at, at E3 2006. Hmm. Although all they shown, sh all they did show at E3 was an artistic concept trailer. Oh jeez! So this is the flagship title for their new Fabula Nova 
Crystallis collection. Oh, right. And then they tried to do like 700 different spin-offs on this thing. Yep. Uh, and uh, this is the first of the Final Fantasy games using the Square Enix Crystal Tools engine. Oh, yeah. That was a whole big deal with yeah. this one. Man, I, yeah, I completely forgot about <laughs> this whole situation. Uh, combat returns to a more familiar territory where coming into contact with an enemy takes you to a battle screen. It's a variant of the active time battle uh, system used, where in this game, you only control the main character and everyone else is controlled by AI. Okay, so it's kind of like um, 12, but you can't swap between people. Uh, maybe. Okay. I'm, I'm getting all the numbers <laughs> mixed up. So in this one, the active time bar fills segments and each ability actually requires the use of a different amount of the action bar to activate. Oh, good. So you, like, charge up to use them. Uh, <laughs> you can select auto battle command, and your character will just fight. And outside of battle, you can't take any actions like cure or heal, but all characters return to full health after every combat. What? Yep. I'm telling you, that's what happened. Oh, that's weird. So they put a lot of focus into the story as it made uh, a departure from the regular Final Fantasy experience. Yeah. The director at the time, Motumu Toriyama, wanted characters at the mercy of predetermined unjust fate. Because <laughs> that, that's what people want in video games. They want to be stuck in a shitty life. Because, they don't want escapism at all. Yeah, because he wants char characters who belong together but collide heavily. <laughs> So the game is broken into 13 chapters and each focus on a different protagonist. And he wanted chapters seven and eight to be a strong turning point for all the characters' relationships. At some points in the story, they did feel it was a bit too dark. And at one point, a character attempted suicide. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't hear more about that. So lighthearted elements, such as a chocobo chick they were taking care of, was in the game to balance the tone. <laughs> oh, so attempted suicide cancelled out by baby chicken. Uh, yeah. Okay, then. <laughs> it, it was originally planned to be a PS2 title, but with the power of the PS3 on the horizon, they uh, really thought that's what the Crystal Tools engine needed to run on. <laughs> the reception was not great as the uh, previous <laughs> titles. Uh, some ratings were as low as 50%, but there were still that rated it in the high 90s. Huh. Uh, it was praised for its graphics and battle system, received criticism on its non-linear -lin gameplay, and reviewers had mixed feelings about the plot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do too. I didn't even play it and I have mixed feelings about the plot. So it sold 1.7 million copies in Japan, and Final Fantasy XIII became the fastest selling title in history of this series. Well, I mean, that's kind of unfair though, because if you come in at the end of a console generation, you automatically have the biggest install base. Yeah, uh, it did get two sequels, Final Fantasy XIII 2 and Lightning Returns Final Fantasy XIII. I thought there was like five planned or something, or was that some, some other game I'm thinking of? No, probably. They just didn't oh. make them. Oh, uh, fair enough. I don't have it in my notes for Patreon subscribers that get to see the uh, mountain of notes I have. <laughs> uh, Lightning was a female character that they did not want to look feminine. They wanted her to look very athletic, so they were very happy to give her her own game. Cool. It's something they were proud about, this character. Oh, okay. So this is a really interesting one right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Final Fantasy XIV was released September 30th, 2010. The second, Wasn't that a, another MMO? Yeah, the second MMO of the franchise. Okay. It was in development from 2005, and it was originally announced to be on Windows as well as PS3. Oh, Jesus. So there were plans to make a 360 version, an Xbox 360 version, but mm -hmm. they couldn't make a deal with Microsoft about the use of Xbox Live, so they canned it. Brutal. This game ran on the Crystal Tools engine, and it was mm -hmm. adjusted to fit the uh, the style of the game. 
the development used many of the aesthetics that were sort of created for Final Fantasy XI, but mm-hmm. they still did what they could to make it its own title. And at launch, this game is met with a very negative response. The graphics were praised, and other aspects were basically panned. The the gameplay interface and general impression of the game, people felt it was unfinished. Oh, that sucks. So due to this reaction of like the the fan base, they the team suspended subscription fees to compensate for it. It went free to play. That yeah. always works. Yeah, and so they had to indefinitely postpone the PS3 version. Oh jeez. Then the uh because of this happening, the leadership was replaced completely on this game. Wow. Then the new director, Naoko uh Naoki Yoshida, decided that after s- little some improvements were made that they were going to shut servers down. And oh, ouch. and they did that because there was a new version Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn. Oh yeah, that's the one I heard about. So it was made alongside Final Fantasy XIV, and they essentially replaced XIV with this version. <laughs> so this is kind of a failure as Final Fantasy titles go. So I honestly stopped writing notes about it, because rev- when I scrolled down, reviews generally came in around 50%, if not lower. Ouch. So I was like, that's... no use getting into all the nitty gritty. Yeah, that that's rough. Like, no wonder they kind of just s- tried to swap it out on the sly. Yeah. Final Fantasy 15 for the PS4 and Xbox One. Woo. Worldwide release November 29th, 2016. This game has an open world environment, action based battle system, which people found very similar to Kingdom Hearts, and it has the ability to switch weapons and other elements during your vehicle travel and camping. Yeah. So they started de- development in 2006. It was going to be a Final Fantasy XIII spinoff called Final Fantasy XIII Versus. Oh, that's the other one I was thinking of. Wow, so that just became fifteen, huh? Yep. So in 2012, they rebranded it as the next main installment for the franchise. <laughs> okay, then. And they fluffed it up with the creation of the Final Fantasy XV uni- universe. And oh. that was a anime series, a feature film, and a VR game. Oh, yeah, that was the film with starring Jesse from Breaking Bad. Oh, really? Yeah, the, the voice actor for the main character was, was Jesse. I can't remember <laughs> the actor's name. So this battle system they call the Active Cross Battle System, which is basically oh. Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> Fair enough. Instead of the traditional menu, the player had an attack, defend, magic, and item button. And you got uh-huh. to run around battle while using these options. That's basically Kingdom Hearts, yeah. Yeah, and the each battle took place in the world rather than an arena. And uh, the player controls the main character, and if you were ever k- defeated, you lose. Game ends. Oh, brutal. Uh, so to explore this world, player can go by car or chocobo. Well, chocobo is clearly a superior option here. Well, the car and chocobos can be customized by the player. But the car, you can drive it yourself or have it automatically controlled. I'm sorry, how do you customize a chocobo? Uh, gear, like saddle. Yeah, chocobo is clearly a superior option. Uh, and the car must be periodically refilled. Chocobo is definitely a superior option. I have seen funny videos where someone's just driving and they turn around and the guys in the backseat are like, bah, like leaning back and like poking each other and they're just bored. <laughs> <laughs> I, apparently also there's like DLC or some update, some something coming for like monster trucks and ATVs. Hmm. Yeah, I keep seeing EB Games bitching at me to, to buy it. Oh. So experience points were sort of earned as usual. and But you couldn't spend them until you reached a safe place that they called a haven. Oh. Very well received. Reviews in the 80s and 90s. The... 
open world games are pretty much standard, it seems nowadays, so I don't know how much more there's to talk about it, especially since we've covered every feature a Final Fantasy game has had up to this point. <laughs> Main series, anyway. So, that's uh, essentially it for the 15 games. Wow. So, tons of Final Fantasy titles were re- re- redacted due to time. Uh, I did like to say, I did like the fact that it was released on a ton of consoles, which is Android, Arcade, Blackberry OS, Windows Phone, Mobile Phone, MSX, Window, Nintendo 3DS, Nintendo DS, Game Boy Advance, Nintendo Entertainment System, GameCube, iOS, Ouya, PlayStation, PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, PlayStation Portable, PlayStation Vita, Super Nintendo Entertainment System, Wii, Microsoft Windows, Wonder Swan, Xbox 360, and Xbox One. Oh, the Wonder Swan. Yeah, okay. I played it on that, I guess. I don't think you did, because what? I specifically researched the Wonder Swan because it <laughs> stood out to me. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Quick Easter egg at the end here. What is the Wonder Swan? It is a handheld game console released in Japan by Bandai uh, between 1999 and 2003. Oh, a four year life cycle on this thing. Uh, I don't even get me started about the Wonder Swan color. Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, that's some goofy stuff. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I learned a lot, and I have an appreciation for this game series now. Yeah, definitely. Like, a lot of people's lives have gone into these games. And now I really like that when I do these episodes, someone will be like, did you know this? And I'll be like, oh, yeah, that is neat also. And then I could talk for half an hour. (laughs) (laughs) Or an hour and ten minutes, as it were. Yeah, whatever it took. (laughs) And uh, sort of as a final thing, I... Thanks, Justin, for a great suggestion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you listening have an idea for a topic you want me to dive into, just let us know. Instagram, Twitter, at PSJ Show. You can also find us on Facebook. Email us directly at ps2jshow. Dot, uh, ps2jshow at gmail.com. ps2jshow.gmail at com. Got it. <laughs> oh, boy. We've also got uh, ps2jshow.com for all of your entertainment needs. We'll have uh, just the episodes usually have like some basic summary notes and a couple of times like when we talk about links, they'll be posted there. Yep. And if you want to check out full unredacted show notes, as well as our monthly state of the podcast address, um, you can check out our Patreon or PS2J show there as well and uh, see how to become our new favorite fan. Yep. So thank you for joining us on this uh, long gaming episode. We do these once a month. Uh, You can check out every weekend we do technology and geek news. And then every Wednesday we've got kind of a variety show, just whatever we feel like talking about or whatever suggestions we get from uh, people on social media. Yep. Or potentially interviews. I'll keep throwing that out until I'm not too shy to actually contact someone. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, if you want to be interviewed on the show, by all means, drop us a line. All you need is a Skype account, and we're good. Yep. So, as always, thank you very much for listening to this episode. And thank you for pressing start. Start.